I love those um, lines that we just sang. I surrender all. You know, we live in a world that is telling us the opposite, right? If you want to be successful, if you want to be anything in life, it's all about power, it's about control, it's about dominance, it's about making yourself first, it's about crushing your opponents, it's about winning at all costs, and followers of Jesus live in a different reality. And we are called to surrender everything we have, and surrender is how our lives are saved. It's a wonderful song, a wonderful um, meaning behind all those words. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm Jonathan. I'm one of the pastors here at Southbrook. Uh, thank you for coming here. Thank you for being a part of this church. Uh, right now, while we're having service in here, our friends in the Dome Video Cafe are watching us. And so I want to welcome all of our friends who are um, in the other part of the building in the Dome Video Cafe this morning. Thank you for being a part of the Dome as well. Uh, at Southbrook, we are at the halfway point of our two-year bold initiative. This is a two-year process designed to encourage every single one of us on two specific things. The first thing is that all of us would grow spiritually, that we would learn to be bold for Jesus, that we would learn to grow in ways that maybe we haven't before. Uh, this is the most important aspect of this bold initiative. The second way is that we would also uh, give to a, a amount to be able to expand and our facilities as we continue to grow here in the life of Southbrook. Uh, this bold initiative that we're doing is literally for every single person here at Southbrook. Uh, just this week, I heard a few stories came my way that I absolutely love. A friend came to a men's Bible study for the first time, and I texted him uh, in the afternoon and said, hey, thanks for coming to Bible study. He said, well, you know, the reason why I came is that last year, uh, you all challenged us to be bold uh, for our faith, and it's taken me a little bit of time, but I'm here now. And I thought to myself, that is what it's all about, right? Growing spiritually. We have baptisms coming up in just a few weeks, and many of uh, you have already signed up for baptisms. It will be on Sunday, November 3rd at 12 o'clock in the Dome. And somebody signed up this week for baptism, and I reached out to them, and um, they said, well, the reason why I'm doing this is because I'm trying to be bold in my faith, and I'm trying to tell, uh, publicly tell others that Jesus is my Savior. I mean, that's what we celebrate here in the life of Southbrook, my friends. Uh, right now, we are doing something called Thrive, which is a five-week series where we, or five weeks where we look into the book of Colossians. The author is a man by the name of Paul. He writes this letter to the church in Colossae. It's a church just like us, helping these brand new followers of Jesus thrive in their lives. We, we all want to thrive. We all want to have the best life possible with our relationships, as in our jobs, as individuals as well. And so this series is designed to point us to Jesus to help us understand who this Jesus is and to help us all grow closer to this Jesus. 2,000 years ago, when the author Paul wrote this letter that we call the Book of Colossians, there were two problems that were going on in the city of Colossae. One of the problems was that the Roman Empire was in charge, and there was encouraged uh, for everyone to worship the Roman Emperor. In fact, if you didn't, you could lose your job. You can begin to be persecuted. And so there was a lot of oppression going on because of the Roman Empire. And at the exact same time, the other problem that was going on was that there was a lot of different religious options in the town. There were some religions that said, here's what you need to do is just obey this long list of rules and obey these rituals, and then you will be good. And there's nothing wrong with those rules, and there's nothing wrong with those rituals, except that they weren't able to fix what's going on on the inside. There were other groups that said, well, it's uh, not about a list of rules, it's about doing whatever you want. Some people said you could have Jesus and some other things, kind of like it was a spiritual buffet where you can kind of pick and choose and put it all together. And this was the problems going on in the city of Colossae. The author Paul writes this letter encouraging these people to thrive, to have the best life possible by focusing them on Jesus. 2,000 years ago, there was some confusion as to the identity of Jesus. And 2,000 years later, we're in the exact same spot. We still have that same confusion today. Is Jesus really is who he said he was? Is he the son of God? Is he just one option among many options? Can we just pick and choose who we want to believe when we want to believe it? And I believe this, that Jesus forces every one of us to make a decision. Jesus forces every one of us to answer the question, who is Jesus to me? And when I say that Jesus forces us, I don't mean that he beats us down. I don't mean that he, he twists our arm and we have to cry uncle or something like that. I mean that every one of us has to wrestle with this question. Every one of us has to answer this question. Who is Jesus to me? I'm going to say this. 
That if we get rid of the Bible, if we throw out the Bible, we still have to deal with the person of Jesus. Because Jesus is a real person in history. The enemies of Jesus, the Romans and the Jewish people, their own historians wrote about Jesus and talked about the fact that he really existed, that he really was alive, that he really died, and somehow, some way, he appeared again after his death. He is a real person in history. In the last century, there was a great atheist who became a follower of Jesus named C.S. Lewis. And C.S. Lewis said, Jesus is either insane, or he's a liar, or he's a myth, or he's actually the truth. Some people said, okay, Jonathan, I'll grant you, Jesus was a real person in history, but what if he was just a madman? I mean, there are plenty of mentally ill people that walk around talking like they're God, speaking to God, and and people will follow them and will be attracted to them. Maybe he's just an insane person. The number one movie is Joker, right? Which is about an insane person that gathers a, a, um, a group of people and they do all sorts of things. And it is possible that Jesus just could have been very mentally ill, Except that there's no evidence of that. When we look at his life, when we look at his actions, even when the pressure was on the most, Jesus always acted with calm and rationality and in control. He cared for others, always helping people in need. It just doesn't make sense that he was insane. Some people said, well, maybe he wasn't insane. Maybe he was just a liar. Maybe he was just a regular person like you and I just lying about his life. And that is possible that he was a liar, like a con man. Although we would have to admit that this is the largest con in history, that it's still running after 2,000 years, and yet so much good has come from someone who has done so much evil. That just doesn't make sense. It doesn't logically add up. Well, maybe some people said, well, Jonathan, there really was a person named Jesus. Of course, we have to believe that. But maybe it was just a myth. Like after he died, the followers gathered together and said, hey, let's all band together and let's just all say he did these things. Let's just all say that, you know, he walked on the water and healed people. I mean, people will just believe everything. And that is possible that it was a myth. Most myths are localized. Like we have Paul Bunyan and Babe the Blue Ox here in the Midwest But if you travel to the other side of the world, they've never heard of Paul Bunyan before. And on top of that, the earliest biography we have of Jesus, which is called the Book of Mark, was written some 30 years after the time of Jesus, which means there are plenty of people who were alive who would say, no, no, that wasn't true, or or, yes, actually, I did see that. In fact, I was in the crowd. In fact, it was my own mother who was healer. He actually healed me. It just doesn't make sense that he was a myth. The only logical answer from my perspective is that Jesus really was who he said he was, that he was telling the truth. His life was sinless. He acted like God. He had power over nature. He healed people. He forgave sins. He predicted his own death, which anybody could do, but he came back to life, which only Jesus could do, and he rose again on the third day. And on top of that, he's still changing lives today. Remember the stories I just told just a few minutes ago about somebody coming to a Bible study for the first time or somebody wanting to be baptized. That's only evidence of God at work changing people's hearts, pulling people to himself. That question, who is Jesus to me, is a question that all of us have to answer. And I'm almost convinced that the greatest danger with this question is just us ignoring it. Like, I've got so many other things going on. My life is just so overwhelming. I've got so many kids or so many problems in my job or so many issues going on that I just don't even have time to think about a question like this. And the good news of Southbrook, I think one of the joys of being in a church like this is that we get to dig into this type of a question. We get to study the Bible. We get to explore and we get to be challenged, all of us to be challenged, with a question like, who is Jesus to me? And so maybe you're here and you don't want to be here, right? I've been there before, okay, right? Like Jesus is just not on our radar screen. I want you to listen because we're going to talk about some things that will apply to you. Or maybe Jesus is on your radar screen, but he's kind of on the side. And, And that's okay. I want you to listen today because this is going to be for you. Or maybe Jesus is in the center of your life. That is great. What you are going to hear today is going to help somebody else out that God is going to place in your path so you can help pull them to Jesus. This morning, we're going to learn that this Jesus is a Jesus, is a God that we can trust with our lives. Everything will hinge upon that. Let's go before the Lord. Lord, we are so thankful. It is such a joy, Lord. It's a joy to come together and to serve you and to give you this praise. I'm thankful for all of our friends in the Dome. I'm thankful for all of our friends in our children's ministry. Right now, teaching our our children and our grandchildren 
How great is that, Lord? I'm just so thankful for this team of people that you continue to bring here, this community that is growing, that is alive, and that is following your lead. Guide us this morning as we open your word, and may it come alive, and may we leave here willing to trust you with everything that we have. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Okay, my friends, it's that time. Let's turn on our Bibles. Let's open up. It's the best time, right? I don't want you to take my word for anything I say. I want us to look at what God has to say. So open up your Bible, turn it on to the book of Colossians chapter. We will be, uh, there we go. Uh, We will be in verse 15 of the book of Colossians chapter 1. It's near the ends of our Bible. So um, open that, find that, follow along with someone around you. I will read the opening verses, Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 15. The author Paul writes, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. Jesus is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Verse 19. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. What we just read there is an overwhelming descripting description. It's actually a list of phrases jam-packed to help us understand who this Jesus is. Look at all the ways that Paul describes Jesus. In verse 15, he says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. How do we know what this God is like? How can we, how can we even fathom what this God is like? This God created the world. How do we know who this God even looks like or what he believes. We look at Jesus, and Jesus points us to the God. We understand the character, the holiness, the nature of God by looking at Jesus, which is why when we sing at Christmas time, Emmanuel, God with us, God is right here. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And then Paul continues in verse 15. He says that Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. And sometimes we hear a phrase like this, and we say, oh, what? What? Jesus is born? Like, I thought Jesus was eternal. I thought Jesus was God. And now you're saying that Jesus had a beginning? And so firstborn does not mean that Jesus was created. It's not referring to birth. It's a phrase used to describe the privileged status. It's a place of honor that Jesus is above all of creation. And then in verse 16, Paul says that he created and holds all things together. It's a powerful descriptor of Jesus that he created the universe. Imagine the multiple thousands of galaxies. He created all of that. And then on top of that, he keeps it going. He holds it together. It's a way to describe the power and the majesty of who this Jesus is. In verse 18, Paul says that Jesus is the head of the church. Head there meaning source. That there's this relationship that that what we do here is not dependent upon a staff person. That what we do here is not dependent upon a pastor or the elders or anything. That Jesus is the one who is guiding us and he is the one that is leading us. And all we are doing, all of us, is just following him as he is the head of all of this. In verse 18, we have that firstborn phrase again. He is the firstborn of the dead. Again, firstborn does not mean that he was created. It's a, it's a phrase referring to the privilege status. That Jesus is the first person that death could not defeat him. Don't we sing that in a song, right? Death could not defeat him. The grave could not hold him. That's what Paul is referring to here. That when Jesus came, that there's a whole new reality. There is a whole new world that opens up. That the powers of this world, that how things work here, that Jesus is over all of them. And while death comes and ruins our lives, Jesus is above and beyond that. It gives us hope that there is something else beyond the things that we see here in this life. It's a very powerful phrase that death could not even hold Jesus. And Paul continues in verse 20. He reconciles all things to himself. Reconcile means there's a break in our relationships. For anybody that's alive, we struggle in our relationships. Let's be honest. It's just true. 
Any relationship we have, there's always struggle, there's always hardship, and that's true of our relationships here, and it's also true of our relationship with God. There is a gap between us and God, and religion cannot fill that gap. Our good actions cannot fill that gap. Coming to church cannot fill that gap. Those are all good things, but they will not fix that internal brokenness, that core condition that we have. I had a friend this week that said, yeah, I just believe in karma. And I said, well, what? And like, explain that to me. And he's like, you know, just that good things will come around, that if I'm good, that, that good will come back to me. And as I thought about that, what I realized was that is a trap. Because what if I did a tremendous amount of evil? I mean, how many millions of years would it take for that reincarnation to come back to fix myself? What if I really messed up in life? And the good news is is that we don't have to worry. We don't have to try to do good things to outweigh the bad. Jesus is the one who is reconciling us, who is bringing us back together with God. How does that happen? It's It's found in the end of verse 20. That he makes peace through his blood on the cross. These are two very powerful terms that are used here. That Jesus makes peace through his blood and that Jesus makes peace through the cross. Let me explain them and hang on to this, my friends. In the Jewish world view, everything was about the blood. For thousands of years, or 1,500 years leading up to the time of Jesus, Jewish people had to go to the temple once a year and they had to offer a sacrifice. They would have to buy an animal, take that animal to the priest, the priest would slit the throat of that animal, the blood would come out, and it's a very beautiful, very symbolic action that was done, showing the seriousness of our sin, like the things that I have done wrong are that serious, that there had to be a consequence, that blood had to be spilled for that sin. And so that family would gather around that animal. It was almost like the sin then was transmitted onto that animal. And then they would have to come back every single year and do it again, time and time again. And then Jesus shows up. And Jesus is called the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And when Jesus goes to the cross, fully human so he can identify with us, and fully God so he can take all of the sins that we have done upon himself, his death on the cross was the once and for all sacrifice for all of our sins, which is why we don't need to make sacrifices today. This is how we have peace through his blood, is that the blood of Jesus covers all of our sins, past, present, and future. This is how we are brought into a relationship with God. And so when Paul says that Jesus makes peace through his blood, that would be something that the Jewish people would understand because they do that sacrifices all the time. But he also says that Jesus brings peace through the cross. And this is something that the Romans would understand. How many of us today, right now, have a cross necklace, earrings, or tattoo on themselves right now. It's okay. You're not going to be embarrassed. Oh, yeah, 20, 30 of you. Oh, boy. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, that's 2,000 years ago. No one would dare to have a cross around them. It was the most brutal, horrible crucifixion that was always done in public. It was seen as a shame, as an embarrassment. It was considered the lowest way to die. In fact, 70 years before Jesus was the great slave rebellion in Rome. This is where the movie Spartacus with Kirk Douglas came about, right? And when the, uh, the slaves revolted, the Romans eventually killed them and beat them down. And the Romans, to send a message, on the road into Rome, crucified 6,000 slaves, This went on for miles. Imagine showing up into the city of Milwaukee and from the border from Illinois up, all you had every 15 feet was another cross with a slave hanging on it, rotting off of it. It was considered the most horrible thing imaginable. The cross was the symbol of the Roman oppression. It was their middle finger to everyone. You dare cross us, then guess what? You know, you will end up on the cross. It was a symbol of their brutal oppression. Jesus takes that cross, the worst thing imaginable, transforms it from a place of horror to a place of beauty through his death on the cross for all of our sins. That's why today we wear crosses around our necks, and that's why we tattoo them on our bodies. It's because Jesus transformed it. In this opening letter here, this opening verses in verse 15 on, it's just, it's power-packed. Each one of these phrases is just loaded with meaning. 
And maybe we can get so caught up in the details of each one that we just miss the bigger picture of what is happening here. Remember that the Roman Empire is oppressing everyone and people were feeling like they had to worship the emperor and if they didn't do that, they would lose their jobs and so there was some persecution going on. At the same time, there was all these different religions, religious options saying, hey, you don't have to believe in Jesus, you can just believe whatever you want. And through all of that, Jesus comes through and says, no, there's a new reality worth living for. There's a new king and there's a new kingdom and there's a new way of living. And we learn here that Jesus is a God who holds the world together. Wow, think about that. If Jesus is holding the world together, that means we can trust him with whatever that most challenging thing is right now in our life. Think about that. It draws us closer to him. Our response to this is to live bold lives, to not waste a moment's time, to not waste any effort that we have because of what he has done and continues to do for us. Now, what we have just gone through is overwhelming, right? A good pastor could probably spend a week on each one of these phrases. I mean, that literally, each one of these is so powerful and so overwhelming. We could spend a year talking through each one of these. And I don't want us to get missed in the big picture of what is going on. Two years ago, my wife and I took a vacation and we went to San Antonio, Texas. I did not realize that was a foreign country. I'll just tell you that right there. <laughs> Everyone talked differently. I had to buy a hat and three guns just to fit in, okay? <laughs> Taxi drops us off in the downtown, um, downtown San Antonio, which is where the hotel was, and we stepped out of our hotel and we were totally lost. I had no clue. You can't talk to anybody there. You don't know what's going on, anything like that. Until you saw the map. Are you with me on this? And on the map was a red dot. And when you saw that red dot, it says, this is where you're at. Then everything else kind of came into order. Then it made sense where every, oh, that's where the Alamo is or anything like that. That's what we've just done here. These opening verses, this list that you see behind me is massive. It's overwhelming. And when we read it, we say, where do we fit in? Where do I fit into this huge story of this power of God? And so the red dot is these next verses. Here's where we fit in. Look at verse 21. Once you were alienated from God and you were his enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through his death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. And if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this gospel, this good news that you have heard, has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Here's how we fit into this grand story of what is going on, is that there is a problem. And the problem is that we are alienated from God, that we are separated, that we are distanced from God, that there is a break in our relationship with, we, with God. And that is, uh, that is the main problem. The solution to this problem is that Jesus is reconciling us. Think of two family members who are at odds and then they come together. That's what Jesus does when Jesus is on the cross. In fact, you can look at Jesus being on the cross. It's almost like with his arms are stretched out, one hand is holding on to God the Father and the other hand is holding on to you. And Jesus is the one that pulls us back into a relationship with God again. That is the solution. And this is called the gospel, the good news, which we remember is that powerful Roman phrase that the Christians co-opted and used to describe the true king that has come, the true king who is in this world, bringing real peace to every single one of us. And this gospel, this good news that existed 2,000 years ago is the exact same story that we proclaim today. We say the exact same thing, that there is hope for all of us that we can be reconciled, that we can be brought into a relationship with God. If we were to summarize this whole phrase right here in this section of the Bible, it would be that, that Jesus is supreme. We don't use that term supreme too often in our language. I mean, we do when we go to Taco Bell and get a supreme burrito or get a supreme meat lover's pizza. But outside of those, we really don't use that term too often. Supreme means to be in charge, to be totally in control of everything, which means then that we can trust him with everything in our life. That most difficult challenge that we're facing right now with our child, guess what? We can trust him with that. That addiction that we're going through, we can trust him with that. That hardship, that health concern that we have right now that is just weighing us down, we can trust him with everything going on in our life because he is supreme. He is in charge. 
on a very practical level, that's everything that we're talking about with this bold initiative. It's all about our faith. Can we trust God? Can we trust God to step out in faith and join a study, to be baptized, to to find a place to serve? Can we trust God by surrendering our life to him? Can we trust God with the time that God has given us? Can we trust God with the money that he has given us? Can we really trust that God is supreme over everything? I want to encourage us. I want us to see a quick story from two Southbrook members who are sharing their story of what it means to follow Jesus. I'm Doug Sag. This is my wife, Stephanie Sag. Uh, we have seven children. We've been coming to um, Southbrook since last December. The first time we came to Southbrook was right before Christmas, December 2018. It was a really good experience, we felt. Even though we were coming from a smaller church to a much larger church, we really felt at home and, and welcome and warm right away. I remember the message that morning about Sometimes you have to take a a leap of faith and um, make changes, not only for yourself, but for your your family. We knew that it was going to be a good change, but just to be reassured that that morning, that very first morning when we came to the service was was really powerful and it was just, you could just feel the presence of God moving in our family that morning. We started uh, coming to Southbrook towards the end of the a bold series. One of the things that we saw here almost instantly was that this church isn't isn't money focused, but they they really stress the fact that um, yes, it's a, it's about giving financially, um, but it's more about how the community of Southbrook in itself can go beyond the walls here at Southbrook and, and reach the the community. To us, that was just huge because that's what we wanted to be a part of. That's what motivates us to want to serve the Lord is that, wow, we can just not be confined to just these walls here in church, that it, it stretches out to not only the Franklin community, but our but our own communities, even mm-hmm. where, where we live. It was exciting to see a church that was wanting to grow and wanting to expand beyond their walls. Um, and, and challenging people to live generously. So even though we came at the end of the Bold Initiative here at Southbrook, as a family, we decided that we were still gonna make a, a bold commitment. You know, we decided as a family that one of our big focuses was, yes, it was gonna um, be a financial focus, but we're also really going to focus as a family of are we doing everything that we can as a family to not only give financially but to give back to those that are around us to to be God's hands and feet. It was it was just being bold for Jesus was the focus. The the financial aspect of it has been fun too to me. I think it's fun. Um, it's always exciting to me when, when we take that next step financially to see what Jesus is going to do in our lives, to sh- see how he's going to show up. Man, it's exciting to see what Jesus will do. He's the one that's really doing all the work. He's allowing us to be his hands and feet. And if you just, if you show up and you take that first step of faith, um, you never know what Jesus is going to do. It's, it's exciting to watch how he's going to use you when you're just available to him. It's really neat to be part of this and to know um, that that God is in this movement. He's We can feel his spirit. We felt his spirit every time we come into this church from the first time we stepped in and to know that he's the one that's leading Southbrook forward. You know, that's what we're looking forward to in the future here is, you know, who are we going to reach next? We don't know. But, but God knows and we get to be part of that experience and part of that ride and just continue to see how God's going to work um, in Southbrook over these next years to come. I want to thank Doug and Stephanie for allowing us to share their story. What hit me with that was when they said, we're just excited to see who we're going to reach next. That is a family that understands the mission of our church. That is why we all gather here. This is not for ourselves. This is always for our friends and neighbors, for those around us that don't know the Lord. 
So here's where it gets real practical for us. And the seat backs in front of you are two things. I would like each family that is here to pull those out, if you could. One is called Thrive, and the other one is um, called the Midpoint Commitment Card. The Thrive is a summary of everything that we've talked about with Bold uh, over the last two years. You can take that home. You can read about that. If you have any questions, you can ask us all about it. But it explains the big picture of everything that we are doing and why we're doing it. So I just want to encourage you to take a look at that. You can also grab these at the bold hub which is out these doors over by the cafe the second card is just a little smaller one called the midpoint commitment card and with this what i'm really encouraging you to do is i'm encouraging you to pray that is the most important thing that is the only thing and that's really the sole thing that i'm asking for all of us to do for every family family unit that is here is to take that home and to pray about what does god want me to do can we really trust god with our life If God really is supreme, if he really is in charge over everything and holds the universe together, how does God then want me to trust him in this way right now with this bold initiative that we're in? And so to our friends who are in the dome, Nick will have those same cards for you and you can pick them up in the dome. Uh, He will give those to you. I want you to grab those as well. For all of us that are here, uh, this is just a tangible way of expressing our faith in God. I just want to encourage you to take those home and pray about them. Again, to our friends who are watching in the Dome this morning, thank you, and Nick will wrap up the service for you. Uh, So thank you for coming to the Dome. For all of us who are here, let's end our service this way. Would you mind standing together? And as we're standing, let me invite our prayer team to come up to the front. We talked about some concepts today, like that Jesus is supreme, that he's reconciling us, that he's bringing us together. And maybe there was something that we talked about that was a question or a concern. Maybe there's something that's weighing on you and you want someone to pray with. There are people here um, that would love to pray with you. And so I would encourage you to come up after the service and there'll be somebody here for you. Let's go before the Lord. Let's commit ourselves to him. Lord, we truly are thankful that you sent your son into this world the invisible became visible. That your son is over all of creation. That your son did not just create the world, but he sustains the world. That he is active and that he is present. And that your son, in the fullness of time, at the right time, died on the cross for our sins, reconciling us through his blood on the cross. This is such great news, Lord. Help us now to live our lives in reflection to that news. Help us, Lord, to see our friends and our neighbors and our coworkers who are lost and who don't need you, Lord. And may we bring them to a place of helping them to see the supremacy of your son, Jesus. Lord, help us to trust our lives in him. And it's in Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen. Have a great week, my friends.